morning. Today's reading is Matthew 4, 1 to 11. It's page 809 in your chair Bible. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you were the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, good morning. This has been like the coldest week of the year, hasn't it? It's been horribly cold. If you were to pick a, a place to go on vacation, where would you go? Where would be the perfect vacation spot for you? Where? Aruba. We got some Aruba people here. Where would you want to go? Anywhere in the Caribbean. We got two people back there that just came back from the Caribbean. So they want to go back where they just came. Yeah. It was... So we often have a place in our mind that we, that we have strong connections to, right? Maybe it was uh, a little cabin in Maine on a lake that we celebrated an anniversary. Or maybe it was a beach down the Caribbean that we went to to celebrate a birthday. These places often reinforce a strong connection with something significant in our lives, right? right? Think of places that you've been. They, they just reinforce a very strong connection for you. Over the next few weeks, we're going to do a series called The Places of the Passion. And these are all the places that Jesus journeyed on his way to the cross. So we're going to take a look at, well, Jesus' journey into Jerusalem with Palm Sunday, the Upper Room, where Jesus celebrated the Passover. Of course, we'll get to the cross, and we'll look at several other places. But today, today we're going to go to the Outback. We're going to go to the wilderness. So I hope you got your backpack on, because we're going to go out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights with Jesus, and we'll see what takes place there. Out in the wilderness, you might remember, is a place where Jesus experienced an incredible amount of temptation. But do you remember what happened to Jesus before he was led out into the wilderness? You remember? Well, grab your Bibles, open up your Bibles to page 808. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3 on page 808. We'll see what, where Jesus was before he was led out into the wilderness. So on page 808, take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. What does it say in bold up above verse 13 in your Bible? He was baptized, right? This is Jesus' baptism. So Jesus came down to the Jordan River and was baptized, right? Where we see this beautiful picture of heaven opening up, a word from the Father from heaven coming down, saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. We've got the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. And the next thing that would take place that we would expect to see is John the Baptist throws a baptismal birthday party for Jesus. All of Jesus' family and friends show up. They're all dressed in nice clothing. There's pictures taking place. There's balloons, a cookout, maybe a, a, a baptismal birthday cake, right, and a bouncy house in the backyard for the kids. These are all the things that you'd expect to take place for Jesus 
after he celebrated his big day being baptized. But what takes place? Take a look at the bold words in chapter 4. What does it say? The temptation of Jesus. And then let's read verse 1 together and see what takes place here in verse 1. Let's read this together. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What? No baptismal birthday cake? No party? No balloons? Instead, he's led out into the wilderness. Now, I've never been in a a Middle Eastern wilderness. I think that would be a great trip someday. But I used to live in Arizona. And I know this about the desert. The desert is a nice place to visit, but you really don't want to live there. There's no water. There's no food. There's no ice cream. It's just not a place that you want to be. And that's where we find Jesus. He's out in the wilderness, and he's going to be tempted by the enemy. I've got a picture on the screen for you. I want to show you uh, kind of a picture of the Middle East, promised land, and then out into the wilderness. Here we do. This is Google Maps. Google Maps is just amazing, what you can see. So that little red dot there, that is, if you were to travel to the promised land, that's uh, the tourist spot where Jesus was baptized, right? They think. Uh, And so if you go to that dot, that is where you'd see the Jordan River. But after that, Jesus was led out into the wilderness. So take a look at everything to the left of the red dot. How does that look? Pretty green. How does everything from the right of the red dot look? Pretty barren. It's pretty bad. No food. No water, no Walgreens, it's bad. And that's where Jesus would spend 40 days and 40 nights. In the Bible, uh, there's a picture, a description of Satan, and he's described as a roaring lion. One that roars and looking for someone to devour. Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter, describes it in the book of Peter like this. Take a look at these words. This is how Peter describes Satan. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So we don't really have African lions in this country, but we do have mountain lions. And there's a, a, natural, uh, a naturalist and an author named Craig Childs who has spent some time in the Blue Mountains of Arizona. It's out near the New Mexico-Arizona line, studying mountain lions. At one point, uh, as he was studying mountain lions, he was off in a distance and he saw a little watering hole where a mountain lion was getting a drink to, of water. mountain lion then wandered off and Craig wandered down to the watering hole to measure his paw prints and just to study it a little bit more for his research. Well, as he made his way down to the watering hole, he noticed off in the juniper bushes a pair of eyes looking back at him, only 30 feet away. So Craig uh, gets up and he looks towards the mountain lion who makes his way into the sunlight out of the juniper bush. At this point, the mountain lion is only 10 feet away. And Craig knows this about mountain lions. He knows what to do and what not to do with mountain lions. Here's what not to do. You do not run from a mountain lion. They will catch you. You do not turn your back on a mountain lion. A mountain lion is strong enough that it can take down an animal six seven, eight times its size. So if you turn your back on a mountain lion, it will come after you, it will pounce on you, and it will bite you in the spine, and before you know it, it's over. So Craig sees the mountain lion, and he pulls out his pocket knife with his right hand, and he stares the mountain lion in the eyes. And the mountain lion starts wandering to the left and to the right back and forth, and Craig stands firm 
looking at the mountain lion because he knows if he runs, it's over. If he turns his back, it's over. And after several minutes, the mountain lion gives up and walks away. What we can learn from Craig's experience and from Peter's writing are helpful for us to how to resist our enemy, the adversary, the devil. We need to stand up, stand firm in the faith, resist him, and hold fast to the living word of God. And that's what we see Jesus doing this morning. He's going to draw from the word over and over and over again, and he's going to stand up and resist the devil. But it's important this morning as we look at our text that you don't see this text simply as Jesus as a model, as a way of resisting temptation. He's more than a model. He's your Savior. He has resisted every single temptation for you. He's your Savior who journeyed out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to face temptation and to walk away victorious for you. So let's take a look at the temptations that Jesus faced by uh, opening your Bible and taking a look at chapter 4 on page 809. Matthew 4, starting at verse 3. The tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God that comes from the mouth of God. So here in our text, we see the first temptation is trying to appeal to Jesus' appetite. His appetite. How many of you have gone without food for 40 days? How many of you have gone without food for 40 hours? Some 40 hours. How easy is it to go without food for 40 hours? Not easy? It's hard. So the very first temptation that the adversary comes to Jesus is appeals to him with food. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, no. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but the very word of the mouth of God. You might remember uh, that when Moses and the Israelites were out in the wilderness, they were south and east of the Jordan River, right? And they were without food. And what God provided for the Israelites was manna. He provided manna and food in the wilderness. What Jesus is doing here is he's actually quoting a verse from Deuteronomy 8.3. Let's take a look at it. It's on page 153 using one of our chair Bibles. Turn to Deuteronomy 8.3 and you'll start to see these connections that Jesus makes as he quotes from the Word of God in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8.3, it says, uh, And he humbled you, and let you be hungry, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus is not going to be tempted by simply bread. Instead, he stands firm in faith, and he stands firm in the word of God. So that's the first temptation. The second temptation. second temptation is for affirmation. Matthew 4, 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to a high city, a holy city, uh, to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and their hands will uh, will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So here, again, Jesus is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, but he's going to be quoting uh, uh, from Deuteronomy 6, 16. So take a look at that in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 16, Jesus quotes those verses saying, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then look how it goes on in Deuteronomy 6, 16. As you tested God at Massah. So Massah is a a place in the wilderness, which means testing. 
And in Exodus 17, the Israelites are out in the wilderness. They've received manna, but now they're grumbling to the Lord because they are thirsty and they want something to drink. So Jesus is actually connecting uh, back to the story of the Israelites complaining yet again to God that they're thirsty and God provides them something to drink, uh, actually water out of a rock. So the devil's going after Jesus by seeking affirmation. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Jesus knows he is the Son of God, not if. He knows he is. The third temptation is all about ambition. Matthew uh, 7, starting verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you fall down, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So here again, uh, Jesus is going to point back to Deuteronomy. And this time it's going to be Deuteronomy 6, 13 through 14. Where it says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. You shall serve him, and by his name you shall swear. You shall have no other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. You might remember when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. He comes back down from Mount Sinai, and what did the Israelites quickly do? They took their gold and they made an idol, a golden calf. So Jesus here is being tested to worship Satan. And Jesus turns it around. No, 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 Satan. You worship the Lord. That's who you need to worship. So you you see three tests here. One of appetite, one of affirmation, one of ambition. But it gets better than that. When Jesus... uh, continues on the book of Matthew, he's tested again and again by Satan. So I want you to take your Bibles. Take a look at Matthew 6, uh, 21 through 22 with me. You'll see Satan reappear, and he's going to test Jesus. So Matthew 6, uh, 16, 21 through 22. Jesus is going to foretell his death and resurrection. And it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples they must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should uh, never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me. Who? Satan. Again, Satan shows up and tries to tempt Jesus, Jesus says, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Matthew continues to show some temptation taking place. Fast forward your Bibles to Matthew 27, 41. Matthew 27, 41. Jesus is on the cross. In verse 41... We see the elders and the scribes showing up, and they're going to mock Jesus. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mock him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So here you see kind of these scribes and these Uh, elders, again, mocking Jesus, sort of like what Satan did out in the wilderness. So even upon the cross that takes place. So Jesus is out in the wilderness. He's going to resist every single temptation for you and me because he's our Savior. The reality here is we have a high priest. His name is Jesus, and he's been tempted and tested in every way just like us, except he never sinned. He never sinned for you. Now, we can't resist every single temptation. We might be able to resist a temptation, maybe a few temptations, but we can't resist every single temptation that comes our way. It reminds me of a story of an African tribe that lived alongside a river. Uh, This African tribe 
was very hungry and they saw ducks floating in a river. So they came up with a plan on how to get the ducks for dinner. The tribesmen uh, learned to go upstream and they placed a pumpkin in the river where it floated downstream to the ducks. And the agile waterfowl saw the duck floating near them and they're not used to seeing the pumpkin so they flew off into the distance. And then eventually the ducks flew back to the river and we gathered. The tribesmen again sat alongside the river upstream, floated another pumpkin downstream. And again, the ducks saw the pumpkin floating down their way and they flew off. And then they regathered once again at the river. The tribesmen continued to float pumpkins downstream towards the ducks. And eventually the ducks just sort of got used to the pumpkins floating among the ducks. And then the tribesmen took some of the pumpkins and hollowed them out and put them over their heads and went down into the river and slowly floated like a pumpkin down to the ducks. So they reached down, grabbed the ducks, and pulled them under. And later that evening, they ate roasted duck. We are like ducks. We might see one floating pumpkin of temptation coming our way, and we can resist, we can fly off. We might see even a second pumpkin of temptation coming our way, and we'll fly off. But isn't it amazing that over time, we just kind of get used to these floating pumpkins of temptation that come our way? We kind of get used to seeing things come our way, and we get accustomed to it, and we're like, oh, it's just a, a floating pumpkin of temptation next to us. And then our adversary reaches out and pulls us under. And we're sunk. It's good news. Jesus loves ducks. Jesus loves you and me so much that he would go to the cross and resist every floating pumpkin of temptation and every floating pumpkin of sin that would come our way. <coughs> In fact, every temptation would be placed upon him on the cross. And he would bear the cross for you and for me, because he knows we're ducks. And we cannot resist temptation. He loves us so much that he would give the ducks new life again. So there you are, little duck. You're a forgiven little duck. You're a free little duck. So fly, little duck, fly. Soar again. You're forgiven and free because your Savior Jesus died on the cross for you and he gives you new life. Amen? Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for loving us, loving us deeply, that you bear every temptation for us out in the wilderness. As we continue to journey with you through this Lenten season, May we be reminded time and time again of the places of the passion that you face for us. In our minds today, in our hearts today, may we be reminded that the wilderness was a place of temptation. Indeed, Moses spent 40 years out in the wilderness with the Israelites, and time and time again they were tempted. And here in our text today, we see Jesus spend 40 days and 40 nights out in the wilderness. Being tempted. But Jesus is a greater redeemer. He came and redeemed us from our sin. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.